Okay, uh, welcome to the Broken Phoenix Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Allen. This is episode seven, Bryce Fordyce, titled, You Don't Always Have to Wear the Cape. Uh, talk a little bit about Bryce today, um, where, who he is, what he's done in life so far, where he's at in life, and uh, he'll give his little Phoenix perspective at the end and try and help some other people out. And we'll go from there. So talk about how I met Bryce. Um, took this job at West Virginia University, women's basketball, back in 2017. Um, I forget when you, when you came on. You came on. Uh, were you always here with Coach Perry Staff when I first got here? Or Yeah. So, I, yeah, I came on as a manager in 2013. Okay. Uh, so, and, and I was with Coach Carey there as a manager um, until you came on. Um, so I was there when old uh, Brian Whiting yeah. was still the strength coach. And then you came in after Brian. Um, Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. So met Bryce through basketball here. And uh, Bryce is a graduate of West Virginia University. He has a bachelor's and a master's from here. And you worked your way up to, you were the video coordinator, right? With that staff? Yeah. So you worked yep. your way yeah. up? Yeah, I worked my way up from, from manager to, uh, like I said, started as a manager in 2013. Uh, worked my way up, um, got my master's degree and everything, then became the uh, video coordinator. What got you into uh, basketball, the basketball scene? Um, Really, it was just, so like a lot of people after, after high school sports is over, it's, you know, the percentages of people that, that go on to play division one, division two collegiate at the collegiate level is, you know, slim to slim to none. So it, there becomes a time where it's like, you know, if you want to stay involved in sports and you're not good enough to play, you've got to take an alternate route. And uh, that alternate route for me was coming into the women's basketball team as a manager, actually, uh, KJ, Kevin Johnston, um, it was good friends with my mom. Um, one day he was like, I want you to come over and meet coach Carey. Uh, you know, he'd known coach Carey for a while, um, and came over to meet coach Carey. And, you know, it was, it was on from there. Coach Carey introduced me to Kyle, Kyle Kiesler, who was the head manager at that time. Um, and then got me in contact with Pat, started becoming a manager and just went off from there funny story about the first time I came in to meet with coach Carey. So KJ told me, you know, we're going to go meet with coach Carey, come in, you know? So I'm like, okay, you know, I'm thinking it's like a job interview, this type of thing. Those of you, you know, coach Carey real well, you know, nothing's, nothing's ever too formal with him. Exactly. Um, so exactly. I came in wearing a shirt and tie, you know, we, we, I'm with KJ. We go back into coach Carey's office. And coach Carey's like, Oh, just sit down. We're sitting on the couch in his office, just talking. And that, man, I felt like a, Felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb sitting there wearing a shirt and tie. KJ's in sweats, Coach Carey's in sweats. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I had no frame of reference. I'm thinking I'm coming in for like a little job interview and I'm sitting there and man, they gave me crap afterwards. Like, once I, once I got into the swing of things, like, man, you came in here in a shirt and tie. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's funny. It's, um, when I, when I came on this job interview, I remember, you know, obviously I'd be wearing like a suit and tie and everything. And I remember yeah. going into his office. It was Lester, Chester, and Coach Rich. And there's Coach Carey and his his old get up man, the track suit that he had on looking like a mm -hmm. Russian mafia boss. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember I had this nice portfolio. I had this yearly plan of like what I would be doing and like with my programming. Uh I had a sample program in there and like what I do for ACL. And I remember him just looking at it and he rifled through a couple of pages and just sat down and said, like, tell me what you know about ACLs. <laughs> and I just, I started laughing. I was like, Oh my God, man. I said, I paid money to print those pages off to I bought like eight <laughs> binders to give to people. And this man looked like at it for about 17 seconds and then put it down. And just like, what do you know about ACLs? And I just started laughing. I was like, oh, okay. So, and then I rattled off, you know, everything I knew about them. Um, th that's hilarious. 
And you're right. Man. Probably never looked at that book again. No, I guarantee it. <laughs> Not at all. I think he gave it back to me, to be honest. I was like, this is yours to keep. I'm almost positive he gave it back to me. And I was like, man, I spent so much time on that, <laughs> you know, just like you prepping for what you thought was like a job interview. And yeah. And he's just like, what are you doing? <laughs> you just feel yeah. foolish. But hey, man, you did the right thing. You. You overcompensated, yep. you know, you'll have one chance to make a good first impression. So, and obviously yep. you made a good one. You stuck around for a while. And I, I remember another memory I have of you being on staff here. I remember us being on the road and coach Kerry getting the late night cravings and you were on this kick about like trying to lose a little bit of weight and everything. And coach Kerry would call you and Craig up and be like, you guys want to get some milkshakes? Get, let's get some milkshake. It's like 12 30, one in the morning. And you're like, coach, man, I can't, I can't. And then he would force you. He'd make you feel bad. Guilt trip you into ordering some shakes and ice cream and stuff on the road. Yeah. I remember that. And you're like, my God, yeah, I, mean, I don't want to do this. The, yep. Yeah. I mean, I'll never forget that one. That was a, uh, that was, I mean, that's some good foreshadowing for this too, what we're going to get into, but that was, leading up to the, to my wedding, getting married. And, uh, I remember being in the weight room one day with you and Craig and we're talking about just getting ready. I'm trying to, you know, as everybody is trying to get ready, you know, get your body right to get married, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. And then we, <laughs> we started going on those trips and I, I think the one that you're talking about to be exact, we were at, I think we were on a double trip. We were out at Kansas, um, staying in that big castle hotel. Mm -hmm. Coach Kerry wants in, he, he's a big burger and uh, milkshake guy. And, and he, you could never not eat when you were around coach Carey. He, whether you were hungry or not, you're getting something. Yep. So yeah, yeah we're out there and you know, midnight, 1230 rolls around. He's like, why don't you order us up some cheeseburgers, cheeseburgers and a milkshake. So we get it and he's like, get yourself something. And then we're up there eating it and you know, you order it, you don't want it to go to waste and he's not going to let it, sit there and go to waste why aren't you eating you got to eat that and so and meanwhile craig's sitting there because craig's craig's in it too and he knows that you know he knows what i'm trying to do and he's just laughing because mm -hmm. there's it's impossible to lose weight being around coach carry because he's gonna he's gonna feed you he's gonna feed yeah. you well <laughs> craig's over there just leaving the trenches taking grenades knowing damn well what's yeah. going on hilarious yep. hilarious yeah that's funny man so yeah, that takes back throwing around all those names. I mean, now I'm here with uh, my third staff, and it's all crazy. So yeah, it's insane. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, let's get to know you a little bit. Uh, you know, we talked off on the phone here before we set this up. Uh, you know, who is Bryce Fordyce? You know, where do you where do you come from? Where were you born? Your family dynamic, you, um, relationships with family, things like that. Yeah, so I grew up born and raised here in Morgantown. Uh, been here pretty much my whole life. Um, grew up the oldest of four kids. Um, grew up in a broken household, I guess you could say. You know, parents were parents weren't together. Um, my sister and I would spend the weekends, most weekends, with my dad. Um, primarily while we were with my mom. Um, grew up with a bunch of women. Um, I have a, a sister who's a year younger than me. Um, we grew up with my mom, my grandma, my great grandma, my aunt, um, I do have an uncle. Um, I mean, primarily like all those women, um, I was, I, I say I was raised by women, um, you know, and that's, I'm, I'm thankful for that every day. Um, you know, my mom, I have three siblings, uh, one being, like I said, a year younger than me. Um, you know, once the other two came around, my mom, you know, worked her butt off just to make sure that we had everything that we needed. Um, there was never anything that we ever had to want for as a kid. I mean, I know there's a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of situations, you know, you grow up in a broken house, you know, with a single parent, um, times are tough, but you know, e even if times were tough, then we, we never knew it. Um, and you know, my mom made sure to never, 
never let us think that times were tough. Um, you know, all of us playing sports, all of us doing extracurriculars. My mom never missed a game, never missed a practice. Um, so, you know, I mean, extremely thankful for that. Uh, after high school, went on to – actually, what a lot of people don't know, when I first left high school, I went to uh, East Stroudsburg uh, up in northern PA. Okay. Okay. Um, my uh, my stepmom and dad were living up there. My stepmom was a professor at East Stroudsburg, went up there for a semester. And growing up here in Morgantown my whole life, man, what a change that was. You know, <laughs> growing, up, growing up in Morgantown, being around the university, going to games, going this and that. It's like you go to East Stroudsburg, you feel like you're out in the middle of nowhere somewhere in West Virginia, like mm-hmm. complete small town like you know it's so that wasn't the greatest fit for me ended up transferring back home uh 2013 so after my first semester there at uh at east Stroudsburg, uh transferred home got into wvu um started off at wvu that's when i was with kj you know for, uh, it was around it was all, beginning of august 2013 <clears throat> um went to Went to meet with Coach Carey, uh, was enrolled, you know, getting ready to start at WVU, second semester of college. Um, and I'd been having a lot of anxiety um, going through high school, um, finishing high school, getting into college. A lot of my doctors just thought, you know, moving away for the first time, experiencing different things, new life. Um, so was treated for that, this and that, got back. Um, like I said, was getting ready to start at WVU. Um, went to see a doctor and he was like, let's just check your heart out. Uh, got my heart checked out, got a call, found something wrong with my heart. Um, you know, within a few days I was in having surgery to, you know, get, get everything figured out with my heart. Uh, had a few, uh, cardiac ablations done, um, actually leading me into not even being able to start then at WVU. I had to take that semester off. Um, I was in the hospital for a little while, ended up having to go back, have another heart ablation. Um, so after even meeting with K, I mean, honestly, it was on my mind the whole time. Like, man, I met with KJ. This is such a good opportunity taking me to meet coach Carey, man. Like I'm, I'm going to miss this. I, you know, and, uh, I just stayed in contact with Kyle and Pat the whole time. And uh, once I got all that figured out, got back enrolled in WVU in January of 2014. They're like, uh, you know, as you know, January and women's in college basketball, it's not. I mean, you're on the road, this and that. Like, you, your head's just spinning. January, February, March. I mean, that's and that's the heart of the season, conference play. Um, so I mean, they were busy then and started. Uh, Right after that season ended, Kyle had contacted me, said, hey, we're getting ready to start off-season workouts. Um, and, I mean, I was just ecstatic. Like, I was like, man, like, I I thought I'd lost this opportunity. I was able to get back into that and, you know, got in, finished my four-year degree at WVU, stayed on um, as a graduate manager, got my master's degree. And then after I finished all that, got uh, slid right into the position of a video coordinator. Okay. Okay. Good stuff, man. A uh, couple things with that. Um, it's funny because I get, you know, when I first started this, I, again, I selfishly did it for me and like just the most like recent stuff like I've been through. And, yeah, you know, I posted a bunch of episodes and everything and I've had a bunch of people, including yourself, reach out and like, you know, just people I haven't talked to in probably a couple of years as well. And they're always like, you know, talking about how they relate to like what I'm saying. And I, I never even think about that. And I'm like, that's awesome. Cause that's like the other point of doing this is trying to help people like other guys, if you will. Right. And yeah. females too. Like I'm not like trying to exclude anybody again. I'll keep reiterating this. I say about guys because guys don't want to talk about their shit. And we, there's still the stigma, like be a tough guy and just hold it in. And you know, tell a little bit of my story, you know, similarities, again, there's always slight similarities with everybody. Um, you know, you're being raised by your mom and your, your grandmother, you know, being raised by women. That, that was me. Like my dad's in the picture. Uh, but my mom had primary custody. My grandmother lived with us since I was in, I think fourth grade. And like, so I was primarily raised by women too. And 
COVID. Yeah, and I mean, that's exactly how ours was. Um, you know, like I said, my dad was in the picture. Um, you know, my mom had primary custody. Um, we were with her. And I was fortunate enough to have not only my mom and my grandmother around, but my great grandmother as well. Like that's, that's something that not a lot of people can say. Um, so, I mean, like it's, it's one thing being raised by your mom and your grandma, you know, you, that, that's a lot of women in your life, but then you had your great grandma in there too. Um, so, I mean, it was, you know, I was just surrounded by, and I mean, I, I owe everything to all three of them. I mean, you know, my, <clears throat> obviously my mom and my mom's still here. My great grandmother actually is still here, 91 years old. Um, my grandmother, uh, passed away here, uh, February of 22, but I mean, yeah, I mean, they are, they were great. Yeah. They are great. Yeah. That's good, man. That's, you know, similarities. I remember my mom had my older brother and I and her, and it was just us for, the longest time and lived in this tiny little apartment. There was no air conditioning and it was hot as hell in there. And my mom took her income tax the next summer and like made sure we had an air conditioner in there. And she would always make sure we had like the new bikes and things like that. And she was at, at, you know, work all day and then come to my practices, you know, take me to practice and come to every single game, and do some travel ball stuff. So you can definitely relate. Yeah, and to I mean, that. that's, that's one thing that you don't realize until you grow up, maybe even until you have kids. It's just like how much your parents and everybody around you sacrificed to give you everything that you wanted and needed. Like, I mean, it's, it, you don't realize it then in the moment. Um, and obviously hindsight's always twenty twenty, but man, it's, it, it, it's tough. It, it's tough. It's tough being a parent, but I mean, not only being a parent, being a single parent and just just making sure that kids don't don't have to worry you know don't have to worry don't have to do anything um it's you know kudos kudos to all, all 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 the parents out there making it work like it's it's not easy that's, that's for damn sure man <laughs> that's for sure um yeah we'll touch into that a little bit here later too as we're both parents and whatnot um another thing you mentioned this is just my personal curiosity. You had cardiac ablations. Uh, do you know like what you have? Yeah. So, so I had uh, ventricular tachycardia. So it ventricular tachycardia is where you're, and again, I have no medical background, so I might be explaining this a little off, but it's where you're, my heart wasn't receiving enough blood flow I, some, something of that nature um, or producing enough blood flow to the rest of my body, something like that. Uh, it was causing my heart to um, skip beats and then beat too fast to try to make up for that. Um, so the way the doctor explained it was that there was like these little like quote unquote like polyps, um, you know, uh, around my heart. So they had to go in, uh, they go in through your groin area, you know, go up with like a little, um, uh, you know, this little wire uh, essentially with, and, and burn the little polyps off the, off the, off of your heart. Um, like I said, I had two done one, one in August of 23. Um, you know, things went well for a little while and then started realizing some of the same symptoms, um, ran some tests. He was like, you know, maybe I didn't get everything. So went back in for a second one. And after that second one, I mean, it's been going on what 11 years now since that since that second one and i uh i haven't had any problems since you know and and, and he was like uh he said i mean that's how it should be I, you know i see a cardiologist once a year now uh just to you know check in make sure things are good but um yeah i mean yeah hats off to him yeah. um that's a that's a tough job yeah, that, yeah. the reason why i asked that is because my son my son atlas he has SVT, so superventricular yeah. tachycardia, and yep. he just my mom. My mom has that. Yeah, yeah. He just had to have an ablation in June, just this past June. Unfortunately, it wasn't too successful because he's only seven, so like his heart's still pretty small. And they found the the electro the um I think the AV node is where his, he has like an extra electrode coming off of it, if you will. 
And when that gets tripped up, he just starts going, bop, 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 bop. and it literally, I tell people, it sounds like a speed bag whenever his heart yeah. is triggered. Like, is it, and he'll be, I'm yeah. having an episode, and we have to like do vagal maneuvers to get him to cardio back to normal. Um, <clears throat> so, again, another just like little similarity that inconveniences your damn life too. Like, and it's hard, and you know, it's a pain in the ass. You're like, oh, God. Heart's being fast. Hold on, you know, because we'll get calls from the school nurse. But like, yeah, he had another episode, and like, all right. And then if he has too many, we pull him out of school. And I'm like, oh man, so I can yeah. relate to you on that one. Um, uh, another thing that you talked about anxiety, and you know, anxiety is something that my, you know ignorant ass didn't understand you know for the longest time like you know what what is that and um you know do you have any like idea like where it stemmed from um or did it just like come on one time and you noticed it and you decided to do something about it yeah i mean I, honestly i don't i don't know where it came from what causes it it just just came on and it's like it i mean as you know it's it, it it doesn't make sense it really doesn't like you don't you don't understand it you don't understand why you know it could be worried about and it's just it's the littlest things too but it's and and in your head you're like i mean that's dumb like why are you even worried about that what is this but it's just i don't know it's a real thing yeah yeah, yeah you know i for me i do know where mine came from mine came from some traumatic shit so yeah yeah uh, I can definitely relate to that and um, how it disrupts everything. And, you know, and I think a lot, a lot more males out there experience it, you know, just, you know, quote unquote, naturally, if you will, mm -hmm. that's not triggered by like a traumatic response. And, yeah. you know, they just, you know, they'll just speak uh, again, just brush it under the, the rug. Don't even worry about it. Like you're not, what do you have to be anxious about? You know, <laughs> Did your snowman melt? You you okay? <laughs> you need a need a pillow to hold on to and go to therapy. Yeah, you know? ex exactly. And I mean, that's what we talked about, especially in guys. Like, you know, the the term like we like you and I used on the phone. It's like guys feel like they just have to wear that cape, and it's like it's it it's okay to realize that like you don't have to always wear the cape. You don't always have to be that big superhero. Like it, it's okay to not be okay. Um, and I think that's like the biggest thing. And, and I feel, especially in guys, they feel like if, if they admit that they're not okay, they're, they're a lesser of a man. They're not a man, you know, because as a man, you have to be okay. You have to provide, you have to do this, you have to do that. Like it's, it's tough. But I mean, once you get to the, once you come to the sense that it's okay to not be okay, it, it definitely takes weight off your shoulders. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll track along here. So, again, another part of um, the outline here. Um, you know, obviously, the stuff we talk about on here um, isn't always, like, the most cheerful stuff. But I think, I, again, it's, it's important stuff. It's stuff to, one, for you to get off your chest a little bit. Um, but all, also to help people, other people, to see that there's way more people that suffer in silence, if you will. And, you know, we'll try and keep it as light as possible. I'll interject some jokes and stuff, man. Like, it's – that's just me. That's how I deal with this stuff. And, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, what's one big, you know, dragon that you face. You know, I, I say dragon. That's That's been my term in therapy where, you know, that's – that's tr some some type of trauma, whether it's big or small. You know, you know, you face a dragon, you got to slay it. You know, what's what's one? Let's talk about a big dragon that you had to face in the past, and you know, talk about what you felt in those moments, and like then how did you deal with slaying that dragon? Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest, the biggest dragon in my life that I faced is. Uh, going through a divorce. And I mean, you can, you know, we, we've talked a lot about that. You, you can easily relate to that. It's, I mean, 
it's the toughest thing that I had to deal with. Um, and you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of time going through that where I felt like made you feel like, made me feel like I was a failure. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm big on how, how people view me, how, what other people think about me. And, you know, the whole time going through that, just worrying about like what, what people were going to think I'm, 28, 29, 30 years old going through a divorce. Like, you know, it's, how does that look for me? It doesn't look good, but it, you know, slaying that dragon, getting through that was just realizing that, you know, life goes on, you know, it's a bump in the road. I'm 30 years old. I've got a lot of life ahead of me, God willing. <laughs> um, and, you know, thankfully for me, at that point, when, when everything was going on, you know, going through that divorce, the greatest blessing of my life came in my son. So, you know, just putting him first, um, focusing on being the best dad that I can, um, you know, being with my family, that, that was a big one. Slaying that dragon, being with my family was, I mean, I don't know, not having your family is, is, is a tough one. And, you know, I don't know what I would do without mine. Um, so just being with my family, having my son being able to just put him first and, you know, just not worry about anything else in the world other than trying to be the best dad you can be. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, you said failure, um, in the outline and essentially you also use the word embarrassed as well. Um, I think if, if you've never been through divorce like this, like, uh, you know, Again, for me, I was with my ex for 18 total years, married for 10 of them. And it it was fucking embarrassing uh, to tell people that I, I was ashamed to tell people I was going to divorce, you know, yeah. because of that failure component, too. And I think that probably sort of derives from us being in the athletic realm and you know, having a goal and setting that goal and meeting that goal and then continuing to get better and all this and progressing. And like, <laughs> I was so embarrassed to tell people that. And, you know, for me, we, we have three kids together and, you know, going to the doctors and, you know, with my situation without spilling like too many beans, but like, <clears throat> right when we were done, she immediately got pregnant and going to the, she was taking that child to the same doctor and like the workers are big. Hey, you have a, you have a bill to pay. You know, you have, you have a balance. I'm like, Oh, all right. I haven't had the kids here in a while. And they're like, do you have, do you have another daughter? I said, no. And they're like, I didn't think so. And it's, it's embarrassing. They're like, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. And like, you know, <laughs> even at school too, it was, I went to, I, I think I went to sign one of them out one day, like they had a doctor's appointment or something like that. And they were like, yeah, you're, uh, that, um, Liz had, uh, the, the baby in here the other day. I'm like, that one doesn't belong to me. <laughs> and they're like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, ah, comes with the territory. But I'm like, God, it's so embarrassing because then people are like, oh, the rumor mill starts. And everybody's like, yeah. what happened? You, you'll spill the tea. Let us know. And uh, but it, to me, you know, I, I agree with you, man. Like you, you do feel like a failure, even if, you know it doesn't even matter the situation, whether it was infidelity, whether it was mutual or whatever, like you, you feel like you failed and that, that sucks mm -hmm. as a man. And, um, you are embarrassed, you know, all those little instances like that, you're embarrassed, you know, you're just embarrassed in general. Like I know for me, that was like two things that I, I never wanted to fail at being a husband and being a father. And I fucking failed like for once in my life and like a big failure. Not like, oh, I failed a test and I can make it up or whatever. Yeah. Um, so like how how did you navigate that embarrassment slash failure? I mean, I, I I navigated it in a lot of different ways. I mean, it just like in anything, there's there's steps, there's stages. Um, 
you know, that, that first step of, of grief, um, I mean, that was a tough one. There was, you know, right when we were going through it, right when it first happened, I'll never forget. Uh, I'd moved back, moved back in with my mom. Um, she was helping me out. And I mean, I was just, I was, I was in a deep state of depression. I mean, I wasn't wanting to do anything. I didn't want to like, I didn't want to leave the house. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do anything. And finally one day my mom, my mom stopped me. I was leaving the house. She said, um, you're taking call into work. Cause you're going, I got you a plane ticket. You're going up to, to Boston. Um, you know, on whatever day, uh, cause we have family up there. My aunt, and my cousin, who I'm really close with, um, lived up in Boston. She was like, you've got to get out of here. You've got to go, you've got to do something. And I'm making sure that you do that. Um, so I mean, you know, that, that plane ride up and back, you know, spending that time up there with them, you know, you're, you're just there thinking a lot. And I mean, I even remember being up there, there was, there was a lot of time where I just wanted to just lay around. Like, I mean, I didn't want to, you know, be my normal self, be up doing things. You know, anytime I went to Boston, you know, my cousin and I, we were, they lived a little bit outside of the city. We were going in, going to basketball games, going to baseball games, going out in uh, Boston. And I mean, I think we did a, we did a few of those things then, but I mean, I just wanted to just lay around and, um, and finally, I think, you know, on the way back on that plane ride back, I was just like, like, what am I doing? Like, you know, I'm 29 years old at this point, like life goes on, like it, it's going to be okay. Um, and I don't even know what it was, but I mean, once that clicked, then it was just like, you know, coming back, trying new things, like going out doing things with my family, with my friends. Um, it was, it was tough, but, um, just seeing and feeling how much better I felt by, you know, not sitting there saying, Oh, poor me, like life's over, um, realizing that life goes on and, and, you know, having people around you to support you and help you through those tough times. Um, that, that, that was huge for me. Yeah. Uh, the depression part the depression. is, is hard when it, when it first happens and to get out of it and stay out of it. You know, I talked yeah. about that in my, episode for uh suicide and you know I, for anybody listening that has listened to that episode you know i talk about some real personal personal yeah personal things and uh i remember just being like you said like just didn't want to get off the couch like i didn't want to do the laundry i love cooking mm -hmm. like i love finding recipes and trying different things uh you know and I didn't want to cook. I, I didn't even want to train anybody who knows me, right? I'm, I'm strength and conditioning. You know, I, I, I love this. And yeah. uh, you're sitting with it in the background right yeah. now. <laughs> I'm like, look, look where I'm at right now. And, yeah. um, you know, I didn't want to do that. And I remember laying there that one day, man. And I'm like, I've got to move, like, go, go for a walk, go, you know, do some carpentry, go train, do something like get off your ass. And that was a big help for me because again, it, it distracts your mind. It gives you another mm -hmm. purpose. And, you know, I think it's genius what your mom did as much as you were probably a little resistant to it, I would assume. And you're just like, no, I don't want to do this. Like your mom's like, mm -hmm. you know, almost like a Billy Madison moment, you know, you get off your ass <laughs> and you find that fucking dog, you know, and <laughs> you, your mom forced you to do that. And, it obviously worked and that's what i tell people too right like if you're and i still i still go through a little bit i i went through a couple bouts this summer actually like yeah mm -hmm. i had just some you know again not trying to spill too much but like we went to italy and croatia for a foreign trip this summer mm -hmm. and we went to the same spots that i went to that i took my ex on and dude, I, I got hit hard. Like I, yeah. I was on that trip. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I brought, I brought Liz with me to Rome yep. and Sorrento. And, yeah. I was on that first trip. Yep. yep. And I, we went to those same spots and man, I like, it, it crushed me. Cause I'm like, I'm in one of the most beautiful places in the world and I'm just like down. And, you yeah. know, I had to keep moving. I had to keep doing something and, you know, as much as you don't want to be around people, 
you got to force yourself to be around some people, man, because again, they'll talk to you and they'll get you distracted, allow your yeah, mind exactly. to breathe and give you that control alt delete for that moment. So kudos to your mom, man. She keeps coming up yeah. and you know, she's obviously played a big part for you in this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, just going back to what you were talking about earlier in terms of like, you know, like being embarrassed to even tell people like, I mean, I'm not even going to lie to you there. There was a lot of people I didn't even tell. I let them find out on their own because I was uh, I was too worried, embarrassed, scared. Didn't even know how to tell them. Yeah. Like I let them find out on social media from other people. Like, you know, just I, I didn't even. Still to this day, I mean, it's been two years. You know, I, I feel like I'm in a good place. I I still haven't looked at some people and been like, hey, you know, yeah, I, I got a divorce. Like yep. they just you know, assumed and found out themselves. I mean, even so much, I, I know we had talked about this before, just, you know, the, the like picking and choosing of people, you know, the mutual friends and being together so long and like, you know, who's, who's, who's friend and, you know, what side. And, and I mean, th that was, that was one of the toughest parts for me because, you know, going through it all, it's like, we'd been together so long. We were so invested in each other and everything around like you know who who was there for who 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 was who was going to be on whose side and you know help that person get through this and um i mean i i hurt myself in that situation by you know just disconnecting myself from from everybody involved i was just like like you know i i'm gonna go through this myself i'm not gonna reach out i'd i'd I don't want to step on her toes. You know, these are her friends. I, I considered them her friends, even though they were our friends. Like I'm not gonna. And I mean, it wasn't until, like I said, we're two years into this. It wasn't until, um, just a few months ago. I mean, her, one of her best friends is married to one of my best friends. So, I mean, that makes that even harder. You know, we're going through that. He, he was the best man in my wedding. I hadn't talked to them and, you know, two years. I saw him at a WV football tailgate, man. And it's like, like, it gives me chills even thinking about it. he, he was my best friend. Like I said, the best man in my wedding. I saw him at a WV football tailgate and you know, he's a, he's a, he's a nice big guy, you know, really reminds me of you, Zach, you know, just pretty, pretty big, sturdy guy just stood there and just put his arms out, just, just hugged me. And I mean, man, that was, he was like, you know, I missed you, man. And, and his wife, God love her, man, she came up to me and she was like, he was the best man in your wedding. And you haven't, I was like, I know, I know. Like, and I mean, just seeing that, like I said, I mean, it's that, that was huge. And, and that right then and there, like that made me realize that, you know, I made myself go through this by myself. Like it, it you know, I had people, I had people that were there, but it, you know, I disconnected myself thinking that that was the easiest way to go through it when that just made it harder on myself. Yeah. Um, one thing, you know, with that is there's no like blueprint to this. There's no, I don't think there's any right way to do it. There's a bunch of wrong ways, but I don't think there's like a, you know, a specific correct way to yeah. do it. And you don't know how you're going to react to it until it happens. And what one thing I, I just jotted down to ask you, you know, was, you know, curious, how did your male friends respond whenever you told them that you're getting a divorce? And, you know, if you have other ones, like uh, you, and you just answered one, you know, with one of your friends, did you have like any other male, like male friends that you told that were pretty close to you? And like, how did they respond? Uh, I mean, uh again, just going back to what I said, like e even my closest male friends, they, uh, you know, I, ha I have a good buddy who had been through this. Um, he was one that I talked to a lot. I, and he was probably one of the only ones of my male friends that I even straight up flat out told like, Hey, you know, we're getting a divorce. Um, even my other like closest male friends, I just kind of let them find out. Like I, Again, I was too embarrassed, too scared, too I, – I didn't even want to say it to them because, you know, I just – I felt like that made me look like a failure. That made me look bad. And um, I just – yeah, I, I didn't even tell them. Yeah. Why, 
was it just like the embarrassment? Was it you were afraid how they're going to react? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was really just the embarrassment. You know, I mean, I'm uh, I was young, um, went through that like that wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to go like that. Um, so, and and I mean, going back to, to 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 what we talked about, just being so so worried about what other people think about me, um, and you know just wanting to wanting to do things the right way, you know, get married, have a life, have kids, that type of thing. And then it's like, you know, got married, didn't work out, have a kid coming. How do you, that was another thing. How do you navigate through that splitting up from your partner and still having a kid together? Um, granted, I mean, we're two years into this and we're, we're rocking it. But um, at that time, it's like, how do you even do that? How is that even possible? Knowing that, other people do it, you know, it happens, but it's like, when you have to go through it yourself, you're like, how, how does this even go? What do you even do? Yeah. Well, it's a couple things there with, um, you know, with the, the male friends, you know, telling them and your buddy reaching out and, you know, his wife saying, Oh, he was the, you know, best man at your wedding. And like one message I'd say to people that haven't been like divorced from their person, you know, give, give that person some leniency, like of how they're going to handle that divorce. Like, mm-hmm. I understand where she's coming from, but like, again, and two, like you've been through it because like I did the same thing. I haven't talked to a couple people in my life, a whole bunch either, man. Cause it's like, you just want a fucking fresh start. Like you just want to, delete almost everything and even move somewhere like at least for me and just start over and, just start. and yeah some people don't understand that and you know to the flip side of that your buddy just reaching out and like hugging you dude uh i know the value of that because like for me at least for me like i told a couple people a couple male figures in my life and some of them were just the old school man up like literally one of them told me like oh uh, i'm sorry to hear that bro like you know i know you you'll man up you'll pull through this and you'll figure it out like you got it i'm like yeah okay you know thanks Uh, my fucking life just (laughs) fell apart like (laughs) i'm used to going home to a woman every night and like supporting each other used to see my kids every night and i'm gonna see them 50 percent of the time uh what's holidays look like you know what's you know mm-hmm. weekends and like all this shit but yeah man up we're good um and i was like what yeah. the fuck that's man? easy enough yeah yep just man up you got it yeah i was like i just told you my fucking whole life is changing and you're like ah you want a beer <laughs> I mean, sort of, but you know, I like a little more input, man. Help me out a little bit. Um, yeah. But like to the flip side, you know, my my second episode, I talk about the support system and having that that support system of people in play. And the best man that was in my wedding, you know, I told him, and you know, we had problems leading up to it. We had a bunch of other stuff that is involved in my marriage towards the end there. Um, and I just can't talk about it. I keep it personal to me and my therapist and everything. But um, but he, he knew about a lot of stuff and that was going on with us. And we went to marriage mm-hmm. counseling and all that stuff. And he was right there by my side through it all. And But I remember telling him, I was like, yeah, man, you know, this is what's happening. And you know, immediately, you know, that one of your boys, it's like that scene from the town, you know, whose car are we taking? <laughs> you know, we're going to mm-hmm. go hurt somebody. <laughs> Can't ask me yeah. any questions. You can never bring it up again. You know, you know, yeah. he, he had that reaction and I didn't, you know, I expected that from him, but it like stayed on the phone with me for a while. And I, I'll be honest, like, I didn't expect him to do that because like he's a Pennsylvania state trooper, man. So he's like a hard ass guy. Right. And mm-hmm. um, he's always, you know, we grew up on all the same movies, the John Claude Van Damme and Arnold Schwarzenegger and like all those like tough guys. And, you know, that's how we were. And to hear yeah. him talk a little more emotionally and like about that, I was like, oh, all right. And like, this is this is cool, man. This this feels good. Like I'm getting support from, a, you know, a fucking brother instead of, 
you know, women who are naturally emotional and can tap into that and give me some good advice. You know, this dude's actually doing it. And I'll never forget, we hung up and I went about like the rest of my night, just like I think, you know, I cooked and I was watching a show and whatnot. And he sent me like this follow up text. He's like, man, I'm so fucking sorry. And like, I hate this for you. And like, we're going to get through this. And it, it blew me away. Like it really did. And I remember that forever. And so, you know, speaking to the males out there, you know, if you, you got a good friend and they're going through some shit, man, it, that what you think is just a little thing is a huge thing. Your buddy hugged you and what, what a relief that was to you. Yeah. It must've been, I'm assuming. And like, yeah. you know, cause you, you probably feel some sort of guilt that you didn't tell him and you're nervous about how he's going to respond. And he's just like, mm-hmm. Hey, it's fucking bring it in, dude. We got this. Like, we're, we're still cool. Yeah. Like I, I got you. I was just giving you a yeah. space. So that's awesome of your buddy, whoever he was, you know, shout out to him. And I bet you, you know, that went a long way for you in that moment. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, touch on here, you know, I won't keep you too much longer. I know you got a little one and you know, other stuff to do. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting too, whenever, <laughs> again, whenever you go through a divorce and a lot of people, if you don't have kids, you just like, just like cut ties and go your separate ways. And that is what it is. You can remain mm-hmm. friends. You cannot remain friends, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. But when you have kids, you got to deal with them for a very long time still. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, navigating that and, you know, I will, again, connect the dots, look at our social medias and whatnot. You can see, you know, pretty much what happened with me, but, you know, talk about, you said you guys are killing it. Like talk about like your dynamic with your ex-wife and navigating schedules with your son and like, how do you guys ultimately make that work like a well-oiled machine? Yeah. I mean, the, the short answer to that question is we, we put, we put our son first. Um, you know, it's and and we, we sort of looked at each other and agreed to that from, from day one. Um, things weren't always easy, but the point that we're at now, um, it's just, you know, what happened happened between us. You can't go back. You can't change the past. Um, the only thing you can do is just make sure that the future isn't as bad as the past. And, you know, we, we both just make sure that we're each the best parent that we can be for our, for our child. And, um, we do realize that, I mean, we, we split up a month or two before our child was even born. So, I mean, it's like when people say, you know, we, I got to deal with my ex for, you know, 18 years until my kid becomes an adult. Like, no, no, we really have that full 18 years to go. So, um, and I mean, we're, we're two years down now, 16 more to go, but who's counting? Um, but yeah, we just, we just, uh, you know, make sure that we put him first and everything. And I mean, it's, everything's for him, you know, we, we're at a point we can, we go to doctor's appointments together, you know, we, um, switch schedules around. We, um, you know, it's just everything for him. Uh, and just, you know, like I said, realizing that, you know, yeah, things didn't work out between us, but we have a kid together now. And and it's, it's all about making sure that he doesn't have to want for anything. And it's, you know, my mom gave me some great advice, you know, at early on at the beginning, um, when things weren't so good between my ex and I, and it's like, no matter no matter how old your kid is he, he could be a few months old but he he feeds off of your energy and i mean if you're upset you're going through something you're you're going you're in an argument with whoever you know that kid is is feeding off of that and and i mean just the more i thought about that it was just like like i don't want him i want him to enjoy his time with me as much as i enjoy my time with him um and not having, like you said, not being with your kid every single night, it's tough. And I mean, for you, I can't even imagine um, going from being with your kid every single night to, to going to being with your kids half of the time. Like, um, 
so yeah, I mean, it's just putting, putting your kids first and, and, and just being a, the, the best parent that you can be. I mean, that takes a lot of time in itself. Um, and, and helps you get through a lot of things. I love that piece of advice that your mom gave you, you know, one quote I say with my athletes all the time is fear is contagious. So is motivation. Uh, so is negativity, you know, mm-hmm. you're poor, you know, whatever you're pouring out to everybody else, they're, they're feeling that there, there's studies to show that, that if someone's stressed out next to you, like, I think there's like thermal imaging to where like, if they're, they're red hot, you know, they're just, they got a bunch of ger- yeah. adrenaline stuff. You start feeling that. So you start feeling a little bit of their anxiety or their, or vice versa. Like they're depressed, right? Like I'll say that to them. You know, we used to have an athlete on the team. You, you know, of her, I'll keep her, I'll keep her anonymous, but you, you know, of her, but she would come in and she'd be mopey and everything. And I'd say, walk your ass back outside my weight room. I need you to fix your shoulders, fix your face and come in with a better attitude. And she'd literally turn around, walk out, and she'd come back in and make, oh, hey, Zach. I think even if it's fake, it it mm-hmm. rubs off, like, on people. Like, it, it that carries over into people. And so... It's funny you say that, because I could, I could think of four or five that that, that could have been. But <laughs> I, I think I <laughs> there were a lot back then, man. Oh, <laughs> it was a different time. That's for sure. Um, yeah, so, but I, I think that's a good piece of advice. Like, you know, your kids do pick up on that. They pick up on a lot. Like Maximus picks up a lot, even Calliope now, you know, she's five now, but you know, she picks up on things too. And kids are very intuitive to that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I hated it in a moment. I didn't want to do it in a moment, but like in the state of West Virginia, when you divorce, you have to go through a four hour parenting class and it's online, but you know, you have to do that. And that taught me a lot. And I was like, yeah, yeah like even like the scenarios, like I knew mm-hmm. going into it, like I, I always, I always knew going into just like you, you know, no matter what happened between us, you know, we need to take care of the kids and yeah. make sure they're, they're good and they're happy and everything and that course taught me a lot and looking at some of the scenarios like how, you know did they act right i'm like no this is so toxic oh my god no don't do that you know <laughs> yeah. and uh you know at least for me you know or your dynamic with your ex now like how is that i mean it's great i mean i honestly like i said we just we, we got to a point where it's like, we're going to make this work. Um, and you know, put, put the past behind us. That, that was the biggest thing, just putting the past behind us, really realizing there's nothing that either of us can do to go back and change anything. Um, you know, I think we have a great dynamic at this point, you know, we, our communication's good. We talk almost all the time. Um, almost every day, but I mean, we, we keep it about Knox, about our kid. We, we, we keep it about him. Um, you know, we spec, we, we respect each other. Um, we, we, we just make sure that we are both the best parent that we could be for a kid when we have him. And we, we realize that, you know, the schedule's tough on both of us. Like, that's like I mentioned earlier about, you know, switching days, doing this and that, like we both work full time. Um, we both have a life, but I mean, at the same time, it's like, you know, if she's got something going on, if I've got something going on, we're like, Hey, I've got this, this day, will you take, will you take Knox? It's like, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I love getting those texts. Cause it's like, you know, <coughs> yeah. Screw going to this concert, screw doing this. Like, yeah, I'd rather hang out with my son, especially because I don't get to see him every single day. So it's like it, that I feel like that makes me appreciate the time that I have with him even more. Yeah. No, that's good. Uh, same thing like with us. I, I mean, my, again, I f- think mine's probably, you know, slightly different than yours. There's still some, at least from my end, there's some animosity. So, mm-hmm. but I've, yeah. I've dealt with that. It's not as bad as it was. Um, the way I look at it with us is we're business partners, right? We talked about this before. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
our kids are our business. Like we built this up and we're going to make this business succeed and we got a good model mm-hmm. for it. And, you know, we're going to make these great business deals, just like what you just said, right? Like if, you know, my ex has to work, you know, Wednesday, Thursday has off Friday, work Saturday, Sunday, you know, but she can only get them for that one night, like take them and then I'll take them back and then mm-hmm. we'll flip flop it, you know, moving forward. You know, we, we don't have like a set, I get them every other weekend with our jobs. It's impossible. You know, you yeah. know, with basketball, I travel from, you know, we travel once in like November. We're typically home for all of December, you know, except for like maybe a, a tournament at the end. And then from January mm-hmm. to March, we're traveling a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> She's a, an RN. So her schedule is all over the place. So we make that work mm-hmm. very, we're very lenient with each other. Um, in those terms. And okay, I didn't really get to see them much through this week, but I have this weekend off again, you know, do you mind if I get them the second weekend in a row? Yeah. Like they're your kids too. Like you need to see mm-hmm. them for sure. Take them. Yeah. And then I'll, you know, I'll, t- I'll get them because again, schedule will work out. Uh, yeah. getting by- and that's a big thing too. Just realizing that, you know, not being selfish, but realizing that your kids need both parents and, and how lucky they are to have, you know, two parents that, that love them um, and, and not, you know, putting that animosity and stuff for the other person aside and knowing and wanting that, wanting your kids to love both you and their mother. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's and not, not bashing the other parent at all, no matter what has yeah. happened yeah. At, at all. And like, I, I don't do that shit and no. I definitely don't do it like in front of them. And, yeah. Uh, and you know, as much as I'd love to sometimes, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Out, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. If, the, if, if we're not around, it's free game. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I always look at it. we make the business deals, and but you know, we don't need to go for cocktails after we make the business deal. That's, yeah. that's at least where I'm at right now. Right, wrong, or indifferent, yeah. but I will yeah. always make it professional with her, and I will treat her with respect. And show the kids that you can still be a great person, even though some shit has happened to you. Um, I'm I'm two years in, and we we still are at the point to go to going for cocktail. So yeah, I hate to break it to yeah. you, but I don't know if it's going to get to that point. <laughs> That's the same way with me, man. We're we're two years removed from it, and you know who knows over time. I I don't know, but I can tell you right now that shit's not in the sights at all. <laughs> And yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. As long as the kids yeah. are taken care of, we're good, man. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, I I've held you hostage long enough, man. I uh, we can wrap this up. But good stuff overall. Uh, you know, yeah. Talking about your mom seemed like a big staple in your life. Um, mm-hmm. just gave you some great advice and hung there by your side all your life so far. Um, we. I always end each episode, whether I'm interviewing somebody or I'm doing it by myself uh, mm-hmm. with the, what I call the Phoenix perspective. And that's like, to me, that's a, that's a quote that you live by. That's um, a song or song lyric that just hits you. And that's how you reset yourself. Um, it could be a meditation process that you found that you're like, yeah, this helps out uh, outlook on life, whatever, whatever it may be. What is your Phoenix perspective for us? Yeah, I would say my Phoenix perspective, as cliche as it sounds, is that everything happens for a reason. I mean, everything you've, everything that's happened in your life, it, it's tough to realize it in the moment. Um, but when you sit back after the fact, like we talked about earlier, hindsight being twenty twenty, you know, there's there have been so many things that have happened in my life after you know, these traumatic experiences, so to speak, that I've been through that I'm like, yeah, if I, you know, if things would have continued on that way, I wouldn't be able to do this right now, or, you know, wouldn't have gotten into this, like, you know, and it's just realizing that you have to put your best foot forward and not dwell on how quote unquote bad the past was and just make sure that, you know, you make the most out of what you got. For sure, man. No, it's, it reminds me of a quote I 
somebody close to my life is getting ready to gear up for a divorce as well. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah. I just sent them this one like screenshot of this picture that I have. And it's like, says something pretty much on the long, long lines of, uh, you know, it's like, sometimes when bad things happen to you, it sets you on a path to one of the best things in your life. Um, I just, sent, yeah. I just sent that to this person the other day and, you know, for anybody that's like in my circle and I know they're going through some stuff, I'll try and send them something like that or something that's mm-hmm. helped me too. So, you know, it does happen for a reason. And, you know, my, th- my therapist says the same shit to me every now and again. It's like, you know, I know this was crushing to you and you didn't want this and all this, but you know, you're going to be happy one day again. Like it, somebody's going to come along and knock you off your feet and all this stuff. And yes. you're going to be happy. And there's light at the end of the tunnel for sure. And Yeah. I mean, that's a big one too. And I mean, just last thing I'll say is, you know, that Phoenix perspective and, and getting through these tough situations, um, it it's easier I feel like it's easier when you're a parent. I know, I know that may sound weird, but I mean, you know, seeing, seeing your kids smile, seeing your kids be happy and just, you know, being able to put everything aside because parenting is so tough that it's, it, it it's a full-time job. I mean, you have to, you know, they're your main, your main priority, your main responsibility. And when you have them in your care, you're their main protector. Um, and just being able to just hug your kids, um, and seeing them smile is enough to just make you realize that everything's all right. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, good stuff overall. Uh, yeah. want to thank you, uh, for, uh, coming on this show. Yeah. I know I've talked to a couple people so far that like reached out and they're like, yeah, I'd like to do it. And we get to the point that I send them like the outline and the waiver and stuff. And then it's just, some crickets start happening and I'm not, yeah. I'm not judging them at all. It, it's, it's uncomfortable, man. It's unhung. It is. It's yeah. And I mean, it took, it took me a while for me to get mine back to you. I mean, granted, you know, I was busy with work and, you know, being a parent and all, but I'm not going to lie. I opened it a few times and just stared at it. It's like, what, what do I write? Yep. It's, and then finally I was like, you know, I had some free time and I was like, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to finish this. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, th- thank you for having me. This was, this was awesome, you know, getting to catch up with you, getting to talk to you, sit down. Um, and, and really, like you've said multiple times, just getting to offer your perspective on life and, you know, the stuff that you've been through to other people that might be going through that same thing. Yeah, man. No, I appreciate your time. Uh, I, uh, anybody who comes on the show, obviously, uh, you know, I'm, I'm poor as hell and everything, you know, I can't afford to pay or give you anything like that. But, uh, what I do offer is, uh, getting you a t-shirt with my logo and my catchphrase on the back. Um, yeah. So anybody who comes on the show, I get you a t-shirt and I'll, I'll get it to you. Uh, so we'll take care of that and everything. And, uh, we'll do the normal sign off. And again, thank you for everything tonight and taking time out of your busy day and whatnot. And we'll let you get back to that kid. So, Signing. Yeah, sign. Thank you for having me. Yep, no problem, man. Uh, signing off. Stay in the fight. Never ever give up, and have the day you deserve. Till next time. Confirm.